Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2023 graduation ceremony of the University of Vermont Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources. This is the 50th graduation of our school. Just a couple of notes, those of you with cell phones, just uh, silence them. And in the, um, if there is the unusual event of a fire alarm, there are exits around the room here. So at this moment, I'd invite you to be seated graduates. And I invite Interim Dean Alan Strong to the podium to offer words of welcome and to introduce our commencement speaker. Okay. Alan? Ah. <laughs> so I am just honored and delighted to welcome you to the 2023 graduation celebration of the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources. It's a joy to see all of you, students, family members, friends, to celebrate your students' academic and personal accomplishments. Uh, let me first just start by giving some well-deserved and hard-earned thank yous. First and foremost, I want to thank the families and friends of our graduates for helping getting our students to the finish line. The class has really endured some extraordinary circumstances here over the last couple of years during the pandemic. We all went through two really challenging years and I'm so grateful that you got to celebrate your senior year with some degree of normalcy. Your students, our students, would not be here if it were not for your love and support. Thank you all for all that you have done to encourage and inspire your students to reach this point. They have worked incredibly hard for this milestone and could not have done it without each of you. Students, I would like to have you stand and thank your family for their belief in you over the last four years. Thank you very much. Next, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to our dedicated and talented faculty. 
You have been such an important part of our students' education in the Rubenstein School and a huge support to me during my rookie year as interim dean. Our faculty have given enormously in so many ways to provide a transformative, there's that word again, experience for all of you. From NR1 or NR9 to NR206 in your senior year, um, from internships, research, semester abroad, service learning, our amazing faculty have inspired and enlightened and helped you discover your own talents and passion over these four years. Students, please join me in thanking our, your faculty for their engagement, their mentorship, and their dedication to your success. And, uh, and lastly, um, I'd love to thank our dedicated staff who support the school and students on an hourly basis, um, literally 24-7. Please join me in thanking our administrative staff, student services team, professional advisors, research staff um, for their re year round support of all of you. I can't think of a more caring or committed team. You should stand up, staff, if you're around, or come out from behind the curtains. But today is really about you, students, and an opportunity to celebrate your success. Students, look to your left, and look to your other left. <laughs> So your friends and peers sitting next to you today will become part of a lifelong Rubenstein School community and will form from this day forward your professional network. You all share the common experience of being a graduate of the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources. You are now one of 6,000 students who have graduated from our school. You are the class of 2023. Congratulations. It is now time to receive your charge before you receive your diplomas. So today, I am honored to introduce my colleague and friend, Natalie Augusto Filion. Natalie earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Natural Resources and a Bachelor of Music in 2005 from the University of Vermont. During this time, we were honored to have her beautiful singing voice grace many UVM events. She returned to the Rubenstein School a few years later and earned her Master of Science in Natural Resources, where she investigated climate change and climate preparedness um, in rural communities in the Dominican Republic. We are so excited to have Natalie back on campus to speak, to our speak at our graduation celebration. So Natalie serves as the Deputy Chief Climate Resilience Officer for the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. And in this capacity, she works with the Chief Climate Resilience Officer and the Office of Climate Resilience team to accelerate the implementation of statewide resilience policy and programs. Prior to her stint with the DEP, Natalie served as the Sustainability Officer for the City of Newark, New Jersey. Resilience Manager with Sustainable Jersey and was the Program Officer with the Institute for Sustainable Communities. Throughout her career, Natalie has helped to develop, design, and deliver national and regional capacity building programs for local governments and community-based climate and sustainability practitioners. Natalie was one of the first of the Rubenstein School's USDA Multicultural Scholars and has frequently joined students in our first year course, Race and Culture in NR6, as a, as a guest speaker. Natalie is purpose-driven in her efforts to help build healthy, sustainable, resilient communities. She is also an amazing person and an inspiring leader in diversifying the environmental movement and fighting for racial and climate justice. Please join me in welcoming Natalie Augusto Filion. Hello and congratulations, class of 2023. You did it! Yes! Congratulations to you. 
I want to thank Dean Allen Strong and Assistant Dean Marie Vea, who of course is in the background making everything run smoothly, um, for inviting me to be here with you today. It is an absolute pleasure and uh, just the deepest honor and privilege to be able to share this moment. Um, it's profoundly moving simply to be here with you, marking this auspicious occasion. Am I, is it loud enough? Okay, good, just checking. <laughs> no? Do I need to move it down? He's very tall. Is that better? <laughs> um, Ruben Singh class, I was gonna tell you to like do a little fist bump or a wave, but you've done that already. <laughs> you made it here today, and we all know that it has been one heck of the last few years. Parents, uncles and aunties, abuelitas, pop pops, other caregivers and honored elders in the crowd, anyone who is connected with us via technology today, Let's take just a few quiet moments to let this moment truly sink in. If you're willing, close your eyes. This is to the families. Take a few deep breaths and try to bring up the mental image of today's graduates. As curious toddlers, at that inquisitive age of seven, eight, nine, at 15, 16, just when they were starting their college journey, now open your eyes and see them today. Graduates, you are truly a sight to behold. I was sitting in your seat about 18 years ago today and I had done the five-year plan, as you probably heard because of the double degree. So I was done, I was so done with school. <laughs> I was ready to move on, I was excited to dive into whatever came next and I had a plan. I had a job, like some of y'all, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was able to face that dreaded question of what comes next, which I've been trying to train myself not to ask our graduates. You've heard it enough. Um, and so at the same time, though, I was sitting there with a bit of a mental fog. I remember that feeling of sort of unease, commencement with all of the pomp and circumstance that this rite of passage connotes, demarcates a moment of transition in our lives. Up until now, most of your life has been defined by that rigid schedule of a scholar. Your days have mostly revolved around your coursework, um, perhaps you know, time with your friends, floor mates, and internship, sports, service activities. Um, and upon graduation, you, you're leaping into a bit of an unknown, a new way of operating that's really disconnected from that central identity of student that you've held up to this point. But the thing about this class, is that you've been there already. You've been through the unknown. And whereas I was perplexed um, about what was to come, you've all found a way to live with uncertainty. In the middle of your first year, you were forced to adapt to a setting that no one knew how to navigate. And I won't belabor this point because I don't particularly enjoy reliving those pandemic lockdown memories. Um, the fact is that you've already demonstrated an incredible degree of personal and mental toughness to get to where you are today. It is truly commendable. I hope that you will hear this many times for the next few days and I'm grateful for a chance to say it. I'm very proud of you. Even as I recognize that the general sentiment in the room is one of hope for what's to come, I know that it is also tinged with a sense of anxiety about what the future holds, both um, personally and with respect to the future of our planet. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to decide what I wanted to convey to you today and landed on the realization that what felt most urgent, what felt most pressing to share was to reflect on ways that I have found to tap into the feeling that we have in the room today of trust and hope and connectedness to each other um, because if you're anything like me, you will certainly find yourself in desperate need of reconnecting to that sense of possibility. On the days when the work of advancing resilience, sustainability, and environmental justice weighs just a bit too heavy. Let me start, I'll just introduce myself briefly. Um, actually, Ellen did that already, so I don't have to do this again. <laughs> um, but, um, Beyond my sort of academic credentials, um, I was born in the Dominican Republic. I was raised in Inwood on the very northern tip of Manhattan. And growing up, I was lucky enough to do a bunch of sort of nature science excursions. 
and other wilderness programs that really cemented my interest in studying the environment and figuring out a way to be a change agent in this environmental movement. And professionally, I've had a number of titles. Um, I was an environmental educator, program officer, resiliency manager. In a volunteer capacity, I've also led community organizing campaigns, and I was a founding member of two local chapters of 350.org. I'm a member of my city's environmental commission, and I'm an elective officer in my child's parent-teacher association. And so I share a little bit of that context to say that I know a thing or two about what it takes for people to come together to make change in their communities. And um, because of that, I also know what it feels like when um, you have what seems like an unshakable frustration with how slowly change happens. I was around seven, um, so my daughter is here in the brilliant sequined dress. Um, I was about seven, which is how old she is now, when Dr. James Hansen testified at the United States Congress about this phenomenon called global warming. And we've all been witnessing the shifts in our planetary equilibrium in the relatively short decades of my life. We can confidently say that around mid-century, when Sophia grows up to be my age and may very well be raising a young child of her own, that we will live in a world vastly altered by this phenomenon. And while our projections about the impacts of climate change are stark, I believe with every fiber of my being that our collective creativity and ingenuity is all we need to face this existential threat. And finding the way to come back again and again to that deep sense of hope and trust in ourselves, in us, here, now, is what's most urgent for me to share with you today. I want to remind you that taking the step into the role of a change agent takes heart, it takes courage, and it demands a posture of curiosity about developing policies and programs and interventions that are effective, but also a posture of curiosity about with regards to self-exploration, right? About what it takes to be an environmental leader and how your talents, your unique access and gifts can be harnessed to wield influence and the levers of power. Being a sustainable champion requires living, working, being in community with other like-minded people. And it requires that we give ourselves grace to step back, take a breath and recenter before diving right back in. Probably most importantly, it requires that we find that path back into that connection to hope and human connection. And it requires that we hone our ability to imagine what's possible, especially when we inevitably feel that pull of apathy and anxiety. It takes real effort. It takes work to get back into the mindset of a change agent when you've veered off course. I don't pretend to have all the answers but I've been down this road for long enough now that I can share a little bit of a look back. And what I'll do now is just share a couple stories, both related to my experience here as a scholar at UVM and with the Rubenstein School that cement these aha moments in my life um, that continue to show up over and over and I hope will be moments of learning for you as well. So the first is a moment from undergrad, um, I had a uh, you know, the college is the place where you <laughs> learn about difference in, a, in no other way. You know, it's a really unique opportunity to learn about the difference in people's lives and the way we see the world and our varied perspectives. And the parents and family here might not realize that everybody has to go through, everybody at the Rubenstein School for Environmental and Natural Resources has to go through a core curriculum that's designed to integrate the more sort of technical aspects of the work with the cultural, socioeconomic context of how we do environmental change, how we affect environmental change. And so during my time as undergrad, the race and culture course was called NR6. I'm not sure there's been a lot of name changes. <laughs> but at some point in that semester, we're asked to partner up and share an example with our, you know, our fellow student of something unique about our upbringing that could help demonstrate how we might see the world through different lenses. And as a city girl, I was basically reared to be afraid of the dark and ever vigilant. <laughs> So I shared that one thing that I thought was unique to sort of my experience relative to this person as a woman, as a woman of color, as an urbanite, was that I don't enter an elevator without looking at that top corner mirror to see around the corner. 
And the young man I shared this with was completely and utterly bewildered by this fact. He was confused. Um, and not only was he unaware that some of us grow up in a fairly near constant low level of anxiety around our safety and well-being, I, I actually think that there just weren't that many tall buildings in his small town that he grew up in. So it just like wasn't a perspective that came up often for him. And that for me was actually incredibly um, awakening as well because it helped me to understand how um, almost impossible it is for us to see the world the way others see the world. So it helped spur a kind of clarity about why it is so very important that we learn about others and their experience and that at the same time that we take the courage to sort of share our stories and the way that we um, see the world along with others in this community of environmentalists. And because I think we all at this point, especially with the, the course curriculum and, and the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement and all of the ways in which we're sort of re-evaluating the trajectory of this country, we understand that this field has for very long been predominantly made up of people who don't look like me, right? So folks like myself, immigrants, low income, those who have been trained, whether explicitly or implicitly, to be afraid of dark, lonely places where there aren't too many that look like us, so read like any environmental program. <laughs> um, as members of this environmental movement, we will continue to keep those folks out of the conversation and we do ourselves a disservice by not creating enough space for black, indigenous, people of color, what I have happily started to term people of the global majority, to bring that creativity and the insights into environmental problem solving without authentic and intentional efforts to set the table in a way that includes folks from communities like mine we will continue to perpetrate the policies of exclusion and othering that made up the early days of the environmental movement. So I want to share that we need to open doors and untangle pathways for a diversity of voices to join this movement with the same degree of reverence that we all apply to the tenet of leave no trace when we spend time in wild places. We need to make room at the table in order for diversity, equity, and inclusion to be a core operating principle of your professional careers. You will need to have the courage to make your values known to others you work with and lead with a commitment to advancing innovative solutions that allow you to bring together those insights that are needed for the solutions of our time. When you create a discipline of seeking out those voices who may be underrepresented, you open the door for a world of solutions you may never have considered before. So as was shared, I'm currently serving as New Jersey's um, Deputy Chief, I help the Deputy Chief Crow, Climate Resilience Officer, and basically the bulk of my job is to help facilitate a process with New Jersey's Interagency Council on Climate Resilience, the moment we're drafting our first ever resilience action plan, which happens to be focused on extreme heat. And as you can imagine, when it comes to conversations about heat and how it shows up, it's forcing conversations and requiring us to have a level of engagement with those most directly impacted. So that might include farm workers, toll booth operators, pregnant mothers, youth athletic program directors, folks who maybe struggle to pay their energy bills. And so even if they have an AC, they're not turning it on. These are not the typical attendees of a webinar hosted by a state environmental agency <laughs> to talk about climate change, right? So I come to this conclusion over and over again that we need to be creative and meet people where they're at. Sometimes you'll find yourself advocating for stuff that feels a little disconnected from the work of climate action or protecting biodiversity or that drive to ignite the passion for environmental stewardship that comes from fishing and hunting and wilderness exercises. Whatever your path, wherever your path leads you, we're repeatedly needed, needing to be in a place of advocating for making the table, for building that table. A commitment to the principles of justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion is something you can carry with you anywhere you go. And your words have more power than you think. If you're ever feeling some degree of discomfort about speaking up, it's probably even more important that you find the courage to speak up. It really warms my heart that when Paul Hawken helped to convene an international team of over 200 scientists and researchers, thought leaders under the coalition of Project Drawdown, so for folks who aren't familiar with it, please definitely go look it up. 
His goal was to prepare a comprehensive list of evidence-based solutions for reversing global warming. And it really touched me to learn that one of the most effective strategies identified through that rigorous scientific process was, and I kid you not, <laughs> educating girls. In doing so, we harnessed the ingenuity and the inventiveness of a full half of the world's population who in many countries have been systematically left out of educational opportunities. Project Drawdown has a compilation of drawdown stories that feature individuals taking action in communities all over the US, Atlanta, Minnesota, Pittsburgh. And a few years ago, um, Grist actually issued a series of interviews that was called Nope and Change for folks that like the Parks and Rec um, series. This is a play on Leslie Nope's name and the Obama's campaign tagline. Um, and it similarly featured sustainability champions talking about their work in their own words, how it shows up in their homes. So what brings me hope is knowing that I'm not alone in this work, that now I have you all as colleagues as we are advancing this environmental movement that is so important to all of us. If you're listening and learning and working alongside others with a similar commitment to building a bigger, more inclusive table, you will find yourself in the company of a group of change agents that help to fuel one another seek out these people and their stories. It will aid your creativity. It will help you see new and different ways to approach this work. And remember, please, you can and should allow yourself the permission to click that unfollow button to reduce the number of folks that are dampening that passion and that dedication. So my second anecdote today and the last that I'll share comes from the summer while I was completing my graduate level research. I was with a cohort of the field naturalists from the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and Ecological Planners here at the Rubenstein School. And the master's program places grad students with organizations and agencies that, um, to complete a project. So I uh, was lucky enough to be able to leverage my uh, professional and personal network to secure a graduate internship placement with the National Council on Climate Change in the Dominican Republic, which is my birth country. And as part of that job, I was tasked with basically understanding how the localized impacts of two out of season extreme weather events in 2007, uh, Tropical Storm Olga, which hit on November 30th, and Hurricane Noel, which came about 20 days later, but a couple weeks later in, in early December, they hit this agrarian, these series of agrarian village, what, what the impact was around Lago Enriquillo in the Southwestern Dominican Republic. So Lago Enriquillo is a hypersaline lake, just to give you a tiny bit of context. It's the lowest point in all the Antilles. It's about 150 feet below sea level. With a really large drainage basin, probably 10 uh, fairly substantial rivers drain into it, and it has no outlet. So it floods regularly, right? Um, for hundreds of years, there's been a routine of fluctuating lake levels with the rainy season, and then on a 10 to 15 year cycle, there's some kind of extreme weather event that um, increases the precipitation. However, the lake's levels uh, and extent had not followed the historical patterns, as is the story that we hear over and over again. And in fact, it has not returned to normal ever since. Uh, so it wreaked considerable impact on the surrounding towns. And my research project focused on understanding how those folks in those villages surrounding Lago Enriquillo were making the connections between those two out of season storms and sort of global climate trends and using that conversation to identify strategies for preparedness and how to better cope. So that summer I interviewed about three dozen community leaders, farmers, ranchers, um, school and hospital directors, social service agency heads. And what I learned might not surprise some of you, <laughs> but um, it appeared to most folks that, um, and actually this is something that I talked about quite a bit with John who was on my, on my committee, um, in the same way that maybe you might experience these conversations around the holiday table with your families, folks will often think of climate change as sort of like an ivory tower issue, a little too es esoteric. And what people ultimately wanted was for the Dominican federal leadership to do more improvements around quality of life issues, supporting local economic development, access to quality education and healthcare, et cetera. So, I was really struggling because I felt like I had squandered my time and that this research and this opportunity to sort of use my unique skill set, right, Dominican, uh, you know, ability to sort of relate to folks on a cultural context and also someone very in, in, um, engaged in, in climate action work. And, um, and I brought that back to the now retired Dean Wong, 
Professor Wang um, and John and Dr. Azim Zia for folks that know him. Um, and the thing that landed was that the aha moment for me came in the realization that if we are not making the connections between climate change and people's everyday lives, the everyday lives of people and families, then we are way off the mark. So I implore you to find that through line. Find the ways in which your work, whatever that is, connects to the core values of community building, of, of families, and make sure that as you are working as a change agent, you can continually make that connection back for yourself and for others. I've found that many times when my frustration with my work is particularly high, it's because I feel so disconnected from real, tangible, and meaningful change. So I've talked a bit about the importance of finding your source of hope and your source of connection back to the actual needs of families. These values keep me grounded but at the same time, allow me to imagine a different world. So what I want to leave you with is this idea that you have the skills and the knowledge to make meaningful impact in this world. You've received a stellar education. You have direct access to a network of nationally and internationally recognized thought leaders in this work by virtue of your connections to the Rubenstein School. Give yourself permission to lead. Give yourself permission to mess up reflect and try again and there's a line from a song called I'll, I'll rise up by Andra Day where she says all we need is hope and for that we have each other thank you Thank you to Natalie, and I'm now pleased to invite our marshal, Dr. Claire Ginger, to continue the presentation of diplomas. Thank you, Dean Strong. I was just going to come up and wrest control of the microphone. Thanks, Natalie, for your words. Um, it's so, I'm so proud to see you at this place in your life, and thanks so much for sharing your stories. And now, it is time for the presentation of diplomas. Woo! -hoo! During this ceremony, we will recognize the following academic honors. Phi Beta Kappa, ugh, Phi Beta Kappa inductees, summa cum laude, the top 1% of the Rubenstein School graduating class, magna cum laude, the next 3% of the graduating class, and cum laude, the next 6% of the graduating class. Now to present the diplomas in environmental science, Professor Carol Adair. Graduates with a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Sciences, please rise and come forward. Paige Aldenberg. <laughs> Leah Emmerine. Emmer 
Alyssa Barroso. Bernard Kiambo Birkencotter. Julia Bolton. Elizabeth Brown. Megan Jessica Brown. Georgia Megan Brichter. <laughs> Samuel August Buswell. Clara Servoski. Lauren Crisanti. Jamie Thomas Culhost. Denise Dutton. <laughs> Anna Edgren. Cecilia Egler, magna cum laude. Rachel Elliott, cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa. Carissa Pauline Finnerty. Christine Fleming, magna cum laude. Isabella Genova. Lillian Grady. Abigail Ellen Harbinson. Ryan Kiara Hart. Jake Bartley Hogan. Catherine Hughes. Ray and Keo. <laughs> Leah Israel. Summa cum laude. Lola Jacuzzi.
Jack Knight. Claire Langens, cum laude. Christine Lawson. Claire Sophia Lockwood. Talia H. Loiter. Trevor Henry Marshall. Caitlin Summer Mazeski. Katerina Anna Men Menis. <laughs> Bela Rain Munich. Trevor James Nasser. Aaron E. O'Mara. Isla I. Perry. Summa cum laude. Olivia Reese Qualls. Claire Elizabeth Riley Batista. Benjamin Timothy Reinwald. Emma Shea Rosenau. Haley Isabella Sanfi. Jolie Scott. Olivia Springer. Eli Stein, cum laude. Jonah Tan Tuan Stern. Tyler D. Sullivan.
Lillian Tus Tatusco. Rachel M. Tobler. Ella Marie Weigel. Logan Charles White. To present the Diplomas in Environmental Studies, Program Director Amy Seidel. Graduates with a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Studies, please rise and come forward. Kelly and Bill Hartz. David Austin Brantley. Sophia Caldwell. Maxwell Joseph Caracuzzo. Paige Lynn Carpenter. Rowan Gray Carrick. Andy Cornish. Julia D'Alessio. Wilder Daniel. Kieran Babakian de Savernin Loman. Alexandra Lynn de Ferrante, magna cum laude. Rachel Drill. Eliza Hutchinson Filler.
Hannah Mary Fleming. Maeve Forbes. Vivian Donaldson Gilman. Emily Beatrice Glass. Lucas Goldfless. Abigail G. Golitz. Georgia Panic. Dora Hilker. Anya Freeman Klaus, cum laude. Grace Kreetler. Andrew Thomas Leibowitz. Noah Mendel Levin. Casey Aaron Mara. Amelia Grace McCabe. Trisha Catherine Melton. Ella Miller Hodge. Carly Wisdom Morris, magna cum laude. Abigail Justice O'Shaughnessy. Emma McDougal Proust. Elizabeth Hope Rackasader. Sophie Grace Regina. Elizabeth Rhodes.
Anna Grace Suberling. Cora Louise Smith, cum laude. Jennifer Lillian Sogan. Logan J. Solomon. Carly J. Valco. Sophia Alexis Valasillo. Heather Walker. Bailey Grayson Weinhold. Liz Irene Woodhull. To present the diplomas in forestry, program director Tony D'Amato. Will the graduates with the Bachelors of Science in Forestry please rise and come forward. Patrick Roy Alex. Andrew James Ayers. Danielle Haley Berger, magna cum laude. Mariah Suzanne Tronier, magna cum laude. Andrew Miguel Conde. Elias Davis. Patrick Finnegan. Colby Avery Fong, cum laude. Sawyer Forbes. Eleanor Waterhouse Fuchs.
Max Hertz. Ethan Philip Leroux. Madeline Jane Lurds. Jonathan Lewis, cum laude. Zachary Marcinek. Connor McCourt. Kai McGovern. David Matthew Orley, cum laude. Daniel Allen Perry. Chase Douglas Reagan. Aiden Gabriel G. Rose. Catherine Rose. <laughs> Lucas Rousseau. Michael Salerno. Jacob Stever. Alexander W. Vokey. Now I will present the diplomas in natural resources. Graduates with a Bachelor of Science degree in natural resources, please rise and come forward. Alex Burnett. <laughs> Lucas Drogelis. Walter Eamon.
Haley Goss Baker. Eleanor Sage Jaffe. Oliver Joseph Rands. Alex Riley. Kelly Richards. To present the Diplomas in Parks, Recreation, and Tourism, Program Director Patricia Stokowski. Thank you. Graduates with a Bachelor of Science degree in the fantastic program Parks, Recreation, and Tourism, please rise and come forward. Catherine Mary Conlon. <laughs> Amelia Sydney Curley. Her degree is presented by her aunt, Lauren McKillop, from the College of Education and Social Services. John Russell Evans. <laughs> Mara McDonald. <laughs> Sophie Hayes Moyer. Oliver Ramming. Willow Shawinski. Riley Shannon. Sophie Thayer, cum laude. To present the Diplomas in Wildlife and Fisheries Biology, Program Director Jason Stockwell. Graduates with a Bachelor of Science degree in Wildlife and Fisheries Biology, please rise and come forward.
Jack Baker. David Batty. Elena Bernier. <laughs> Valerie A. Bassett. Eamon C. Caffrey. Elijah Lijuo Meyer Capri. Ethan Anderson Carr. James P. Clausen. Clarissa Emma Crisotti. Maeve Cronin. Jess Davidson. Alejandro de los Rios. Kyle H. Elms. John Samuel Farrell. Samuel D. Fisk. Mia Harris. Michael Kerry Jensen. Thomas Keegan. Hannah Letty. Zoe Ann Lewis. Malachi Lytle. Spencer Mann. Eric McLysat. Suzanne Moray Straton. Christina Elizabeth Murtha.
Emily Rose Parabello. Guido Reinhardt Rare. Alex Raylick. Jessica Ridge. Rebecca Shea Ross. Allie Shires. Benjamin C. Simmons, cum laude. Bethany Helena Smith. Jonathan Lee Solomon. Camilla Maria Sucre. Julieta C. Tucci. Jack Hillebrandt Wallace. Grace M. Yaris. Congratulations. Yay. Now we will recognize students who have completed requirements to graduate as University of Vermont Honors College Scholars. The Honors College is a three to four year academic enrichment experience that culminates in the preparation, presentation, and defense of a senior honors thesis. Interim Associate Dean John Erickson will present the Undergraduate Honors College Scholar Awards. John. All right, here we go. Honors College. Woo. Could we have our honors students please rise and come up forward, starting with Jack Baker. <laughs> <laughs> all of you, all of you come at once, please. They'll sort you out. I don't need to do that. Come on up. Stand. 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 
should be over to the right. Uh, it's still not good enough. Okay, up first, Jack Baker. Thesis title, Comparison of Stocking Strategies on Lipid Resources in Age 1 to Age 3, Feral Lake Trout. His advisor was Ellen Marsden. Samuel August Buswell. Thesis title, Ability of Vermont Restored Wetlands to Sequester Phosphorus from Floodwaters. Advisor, Eric Roy. Okay. Amon C. Caffrey, thesis title, Effects of Substrate Type on Threats to Threatened Northern Diamondback Terrapin. Nest Success in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, advisor Brittany Moiser. <laughs> Lauren Crisanti, thesis title, Characterization of LDD Moth Defoliation in Vermont, Comparing UAS and Satellite Data, advisor Jarleth O'Neill Dunn. Cecilia Egler, thesis title, Designing and Testing a Monitoring Protocol for River Corridor Easements in Vermont. Advisor, Chris Stepanov. Rachel Elliott, thesis title, Environmental Injustice from the Ground Up, Variation of Soil Health in Burlington, Vermont's Community Gardens. Advisor, Deborah Nyer. <laughs> Ryan Chiari Hart, thesis title, Early Life Trade-Offs in Golden Mantled Ground Squirrel Sociality and Growth Rate. Advisor, Caitlin Wells. Emma Shea Rosenau, thesis title, The Impact of Environmental Factors on Invasive V Major Management in the Sonoran Desert, advisor, Eric Roy. <laughs> Benjamin C. Simmons, thesis title, Characterizing Dietary Niche of Two Exotic Ungulates in Central New Mexico, advisor, Alan Strong. Eli Stein, thesis title, Evaluating the Success of Fishing Advisories Among Angling Groups in the Greater Burlington Area, Vermont, advisor, Ariana Chiapelli. Grace M. Yaros, thesis title, Use of Artificial nest, nest Boxes by American Kestrels in Western Vermont. Advisor, Alan Strong. Okay. Please congratulate our Honors Thesis awardees.
Yeah, we tried to hold out on one of those gifts. But everyone got one. <laughs> so now, Professors Jillian Galford and Walt Pullman will recognize one of our graduates who received a university award at this morning's commencement ceremony. Jillian and Walt. I would like to invite Jonah Stern to join us on the stage. Jonah is the recipient of the Kidder Medal, which is awarded to the UVM senior, ranking first in leadership, scholarship, and character. It is named of honor, in honor of Fred T. Kidder, an 1880 graduate who received his MD degree in 1883 and later served on the University of Vermont Board of Trustees. Jonah's nominator wrote, Jonah shares an extraordinary strength of readily being able to apply his friendly personality, great interpersonal skills, advocacy to support students from marginalized backgrounds, as well as his outstanding curiosity to explore multicultural relations to our predominantly white institution. Throughout his time at UVM, Jonah has served as an excellent leadership role in the Asian Student Union and for people of color outdoors. Jonah, it's been an honor being your advisor. Jonah has also played an exceptionally important role as a leader in NR1 and 2, the Rubenstein School's year-long uh, year set of courses for all entering students, natural history and human ecology. In addition to serving as an outstanding teaching assistant, Jonah also linked the urban ecologies of Burlington and New York City by forging an innovative partnership exchange with the High School for Environmental Studies Manhattan and the New York's uh, Department of Parks and Recreation. Thank you, Jonah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Awesome. Interim Dean Strong will now recognize Masters of Science, Master of Professional Studies, and Doctor of Philosophy graduates. Following this, he will recognize Emeriti faculty and then offer some concluding remarks. Thank you, Claire. So congratulations to our students graduating with a Master of Science, Master of Professional Studies, and Doctor of Philosophy degrees. These students were honored yesterday in a special hooding ceremony that was conducted by the university's uh, graduate college. 10 of our graduates received Master of Science degrees. Six of our graduates received Masters of Professional Studies degrees. And two graduates received Doctor of Philosophy degrees. And you can find their names, their thesis titles, and their advisors in your program. So I know that uh, all of you were welcomed to the Rubenstein School by Dean Nancy Matthews, who left for Central Michigan University. And last year, she refused to allow us to read a citation of her. So um, I get to do that now. <laughs> Unfortunately, she's not here. But uh, Dr. Nancy Ellen Matthews, you earned your PhD from the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. And from 2014 to 2022, you served as Dean and Professor of Wildlife and Fisheries Biology in the Rubenstein School at UVM. Your leadership sparked unprecedented growth in the school. 
You hired 24 new faculty during your eight years as dean and doubled our perennial internship program. Your vision for cutting edge research led to our new hybrid research vessel and laid the groundwork for a research and stewardship center on Mount Mansfield. You catalyzed the school's work around diversity, equity, and inclusion. You raised funding to support students of color and helped other universities integrate DEI into their curricula. In 2018, you were awarded the UBM Mosaic Center Student of Color Tim Shiner Outstanding Ally Award. Thank you for your leadership in growing the reach and reputation of the Rubenstein School. Graduates, this is my first time being up on stage in front of you, and I'm just so honored to have been able to work with all of you and our faculty and staff throughout this academic year. I learned so much from you, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's in the field, or in the hallowed hallways of Aiken. Thank you for your support in helping me navigate this first year as interim dean. In several courses in the Rubenstein School, we've talked about the work of Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen. Dr. Remen founded the Remen Institute for the Study of Health and Illness at Wright State University, which, um, and a lot of her work is really focused on the role of personal relationships in healing. And one of my favorite essays by Dr. Remen uh, gives three perspectives on viewing life and the world around us, helping fixing, and serving. Dr. Remen writes, when we help, we see life as weak. When we fix, we see life as broken. But when we serve, we see life as whole. And I find these perspectives really helpful when I think about how I engage with others. Am I coming to the class to fix you all? Am I coming to help you? Or am I coming to serve you? Helping and fixing are not relationships among equals. Um, they really amplify the shortcomings of others. But when we serve, we come from a place of equality, which requires us to know that our humanity in our community, in fact, all of us as part of a learning community, are more powerful than our individual expertise. And when we serve, when we, serve we have to ask different types of questions. We can't simply ask, who do you cook for? We also must ask, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? And serving can, can be translated into any language, even the language of the natural world. And I would love to have you all join me in evoking service through the bird world. Students, faculty, on three. I, I think we need service one more time. Can we all put, put our uh, bird service together on three? One, two, three. <laughs> so the next time you hear a barred owl, consider the way in which you are engaging with others. Are you helping, are you fixing, or are you serving? I wish you all the very best. Please stay in touch and come back to visit us. Best of luck as you move forward in whatever comes next in your life. Thank you all, all of you, for being here today. Safe journeys, and congratulations, class of 2023.
I saw one or two hats go up, but <laughs> there go there go a few more. That looked pretty good. In fact, more enthusiastic than that barred owl call. <laughs> so it is my pleasure to declare these proceedings to be adjourned. I do ask that the audience please remain in their seats until the faculty and graduates have recessed. Thank you.